This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Welcome to the Friday Morning Break with John Gibbs. As after a career in teaching, I continue to explore what schools are for. And to help me understand this question, my guest this week, Dr. Laura D'Olimpio, and we discuss the importance of an aesthetic understanding of art. Art for the sake of art. I think you'd enjoy our discussion. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. And we're back with my guest, Dr. Laura D'Olimpio. Laura is Associate Professor of Education and Director of Postgraduate Research at Birmingham University School of Education. Laura's field is the philosophy of education. We're going to discuss this week Laura's work on the aesthetics of art and teaching aesthetics as part of a study of art and so much more. Laura has written extensively on this subject in multiple books, pamphlets and articles. Laura, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, you're very welcome to be here. And uh, my, my somewhat pretentious exploration of what schools are for, and I think your observation that there is, a, there is something particular about aesthetic education and an appreciation of art goes to the heart of what education itself is for, I think. Um, and, and we let's start with schools. What are they for? They're for creating a flourishing life. Absolutely. I don't think that this is a pretentious question at all. I think it's a vital question. If we're going to grab all of these young people and show them in schools and make them stay there for these long periods of time, then we absolutely should be asking why are we doing this and what do we want to get out of it? And hopefully that the students themselves are having an enjoyable time while they're there. Maybe that's a bit too much to ask, but I think that <laughs> we should be asking those questions. I, you know, that's, I'm so glad you said that. I think schools should be enjoyable. And you, and you think to yourself, well, of course they are. I mean, lots of kids are going to listen, people are going to say, well, my school days were great, the best years of my life and all that stuff. But an awful lot of children leave school that don't enjoy it. I think joy should be a part of school life. That's right. And I think in some ways, school is increasingly stressful. And I think that's also a cause for concern. And there should be questions around that as well. But um, but slightly tangential, perhaps, to the point today, which is, as you say, my answer is that the schools are an important part of helping young people be able to have this flourishing life and go on as adults to know how they can choose things that are good for them, that they're going to you know, find meaning in, I want to say enjoy, but it's not just always about happy, happy, um, but find meaning and purpose in so that they contribute, you know, to their lives and to the world that they're a part of in this way. And for me, that aesthetic enjoyment, the aesthetic experience is a key element of the lives that we live that are fully human. Yeah, so it's making a distinction between, as you say, going to the Alton Towers and, and saying that was great, that was, I, was, I was amazed, and a difference between encountering something more meaningful, which is what I think you're suggesting, and I've got to say I agree with you, is, is the experience of going into an art gallery, for, for instance, or being approaching art with someone who helps you to understand that art. Exactly. I think that, of course, there are going to be all the mundane parts of our lives and things that we need to do to survive, really. But the fully human life is going to make use of our capacities in a greater way than that. And so in my defence um, of the flourishing life, I, I connect to Mother Nussbaum's idea of the central human capabilities. And one of them, she talks about our capability of senses, imagination and thought. And of course, we all have this. We're all using our senses, our cognition, um, our imagination. That's a part of us um, as humans. 
but we can use that, you know, to greater or lesser extents, we can augment that. And if we're inducted into this range of experiences that is there as an option for us to choose, such as all of the creative and art experiences, then firstly, we'll be more likely to understand how to access that and use it and maybe even create such aesthetic experiences for others. Um, but secondly, you know, then we'll be able to know that that's an option on the table for us to choose. Um, and they might not be as readily accessible if we're not inducted into them as you say, through the guide, through the expert, through the art teacher. Yeah, but you're not you're not simply making a well, you're not making a case. I think just simply that um, art is about uh, a kind of um, therapy. You know, we'll, we'll we'll be emotionally better because of this. It's something more than that, isn't it? So I look at some of the different defences that are offered for art, and I consider some of the defences that are on the educational curriculum currently, and then I consider some others and which defence I'd like to go for. And I make a distinction between some of the sort of extrinsic or instrumental benefits versus intrinsic value of of art. And I think there's room for both, right? So I think that art therapy, really valuable, great, wonderful, Um, you know, when done in the right way and if it's for the for the person and it suits them and it's helping them, um, I'm completely in favour of these kinds of things. But I wanted to get to the heart of why should we make all kids do art? And for me, there was something important about the arts themselves. You know, what, what justifies an education in arts rather than in something else for the purpose of, you know, using arts for other means, which we might do as well. And for me, the intrinsic benefit of the arts is that they afford and they're deliberately created to afford us these aesthetic experiences. Do you think this is particularly relevant now? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of a prime minister who su- suggests, rather oddly, maybe not oddly because he he's, comes from an accountancy background, that mathematics should be taught all the way through school. There's nothing wrong with mathematics. A beautiful subject, and maybe we should all be quite good at that, really. But there is an instrumentalism in, in education right now a kind of desire that it should produce some outcome in the economy. Schools should be engines of productive people. And so your argument might be, well, you know, aesthetics, beauty and the sublime is all very well, but it doesn't really make stuff, does it? Well, this is, I think this is a really interesting point. So the arts have suffered as we have this increasingly narrow focus and it's, in schools, as you say, and and in society more generally, where there's this gearing towards, well, what's going to be useful and and productive and and make us money? And and there's a few different responses that we can make to this. One, firstly, I think the flourishing life is going to be diminished if we're cutting out those wonderful, creative, artistic, beautiful experiences, for sure. Um, And and the second is, well, we could try and mount this instrumental defence of art and we could say, well, actually, it's a great contributor to the economy and to our cultural capital and all of these things. And so that's not to be denied. I think, you know, we can can certainly say there are jobs in the arts and artists are often self-employed. But, of course, the question is, do we want to defend arts in that way? Because then we're defending it in these sort of more narrow terms and Basically, although that's true, they offer so much more than that. They're so much more enriching. And I think we need to return to remind people of what's so wonderful about the arts. And in a way, it's acknowledged on the curriculum. So the arts are mandatory on the national curriculum that, you know, they are taught and they're taught in a broad way. It's not just, as you say, arts making. There's art theory. There's the social, cultural, history and context that goes along with that. Um, And so they are spoken about in these very positive terms. But in reality, the cuts to the number of art teachers being employed, the number of students taking art, art, GCSEs and A-levels, you know, the the drop-off since 2011 is is quite noticeable and and dramatic. It has stabilised over the last few years, but it's still a lot less um, than it was. And some explanation might be going back to your original question, that increased focus on mathematics, English, science subjects. Yeah, the so-called STEM subjects. Absolutely. And uh, again, nothing, again, all those subjects have their own merits, but there is uh, an instrumentalism, a, a economic outcome, 
that schools should be producing something beneficial to the economy. So when you when you go round an art gallery, or when you're in front of a group of students who are looking at a painting, or any piece of work for that matter, what is the what is how is that contributing to their flourishing life? How 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 how, how do you induct them into that? I think that's a really interesting question, and 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 in the practical sense, there might be lots of different ways that you do that. Um, I'm a philosopher, so my interest sort of I take a step back to start with and think about the the theory that's behind this, and going back to that idea that we have this innate capacity, like an art instinct, if you like, to appreciate the aesthetic, the beauty, the sublime. Um, it most often just comes across, you know, we have a feeling if we look at a beautiful sunset or um, the beach. I mean, maybe maybe not English beaches, but the beach. And <laughs> well. Rolling hills, countryside, maybe that's <laughs> the example I should use. Um, but I think that we need to sometimes realise that we can gain access to this beautiful, wondrous, you know, or inspiring and sometimes shocking experience through many different media. And artworks are particularly created to have all of these amazing experiences and feelings and thoughts associated with them. And, and it isn't always just that they're beautiful or that that's pleasant. It might be, you know, really makes us think about something in a different way or presents something that we've looked at a million times before in a new way and we suddenly see something that we've never seen in even just a piece of fruit before. And so this, I think, helps us to look more closely. Uh, Maxine Green says, you know, to notice the things that are there to be noticed, um, this sort of attentive attitude. And it helps you to sort of make meaning in the world in, I guess, an enriched way. And so it's not to say that we wouldn't anyway, but I think that by augmenting that, we open up the door to so many more experiences and it does connect to personal meaning making Mm, um mm, but these feelings that we count as valuable aren't just as you say reductive it's not just financially valuable or you know i've got a, a good test result something might just be beautiful and that's really valuable and we need to be able to remember that aesthetic value is a is a value in our lives and in our worlds that counts it matters yeah and so we, you're saying something, well, being a philosopher, you're saying something profound. That's probably what philosophers do. <laughs> so you're saying something about the nature of us and our experience of the world that is hardwired into our consciousness about the, the seeking out of beauty or the seeking out of aesthetic experience. It's not necessarily beauty, but I'll use beauty in the sense of the sublime as, a, as opposed to just the pretty or whatever. Something meaningful in the world. I think that, that's right. Yeah, that, that I suppose that the, the problem, not the problem, isn't it really a problem for that, but the, dan- the danger might be that we could ex- say that some people are going to find that more than others and it becomes excluding. Right, so this you is have, why. I think, you have that capacity, others don't. Right, exactly. So I think this is exactly why it should be justified on the curriculum in this way is to say this is something that everyone's entitled to everyone has this capacity and then it's a question of how do we help people to find that more rather than less and it might be that you know you might be raised in um, a family where art is a really big part of that world or um, your culture and you already are you know engaging with it all the time or very very naturally but there are other people who aren't and increasingly as we're urbanised and we're in these city landscapes, we might not have the natural, um, you know, as many opportunities to explore a steady experience in nature, in really amazing landscapes. And so I think art is one way to bring it to people, because as you say, you can take people to art galleries, but also you can bring it into the classroom and participate in art making and creating. And in this way, I mean, one of the other things I talk about is widening the canon. And so get the art forms that kids are already interested in and start to use those as well. So it doesn't just have to be the works of Shakespeare, which are amazing, but they're also difficult um, to just get on the first go. Start with uh, pop music, with TV shows that kids are enjoying and, and films. 
you know, and but bring in that critical reflection, that that theory. Um, you ask how I would do it. I bring in some of the philosophical use of like big questions and and how artworks are exploring those, and I just find that's really interesting. And but obviously that's connecting much more with these kinds of um, cerebral sort of big questions and thinking. Get them get them curious. Get them interested in it. Teaching is a rewarding profession, but it comes with its fair share of challenges. That's where ADAPT come in. We're not your typical trade union, but instead a modern, apolitical alternative, offering expert legal, employment and mental health support. Protection without the politics. So what makes ADAPT different? We're always apolitical and independent, specialised solely in supporting individual teachers. Our caseworkers are professionally qualified, ensuring you always get the best advice. Plus, there's 24-7 mental health support. Whether it's a simple contract check or handling serious allegations, EDAPT are here for you. Join the thousands of educators who've chosen EDAPT to protect their careers. Subscribe at edapt.org.uk today. EDAPT. Supporting school staff. Protecting careers. You're listening to the Friday Morning Break with John Gibbs and my guest this week, Dr. Laura Delimpia, Associate Professor in the School of Education at Birmingham University. And we're discussing art education and the importance of an aesthetic approach. It's a way of looking at the world, isn't it? It's a, way, it's, a, it's a way of appreciating not just, in fact, in some senses, the art gallery itself becomes a little less relevant and wonderful places that they are. The, because the gallery is a is a portal through which you go and say, this is art and what you just came out of, the world outside there, wasn't art. And what you seem to be saying is that, well, I don't, it's made common sense really, that all the world has, has potential beauty in it if you care to look at it in a certain way. And that, that's the educational purpose, to look at, to look for beauty in the world, look for sublime in the world. Look for I meaning, think that's right. meaning I think, in the world. Yeah, and I think that the more we appreciate the aesthetic, then there is more of a demand for it to be a part of your everyday world. So there is this movement called everyday aesthetics um, and the idea that when you do utilitarian designs that might just be about, you know, traffic flow or how people move through a space, that it should also be beautiful because, you know, architecture is something that we have to walk past every day. It's it's something that we can't avoid. Um, so why not, you know, make sure that it's also pleasing or that there there are gardens to enjoy. I mean, England's quite good at this. I think there is a real appreciation and a history associated with the aesthetic value in this country. But that's why when we look at the dropping off of how many students are taking up art at GCSE and A-levels and how fewer t- art teachers being employed, we need to go back to, to remembering, well, unless we keep valuing it, it, it will drop off and then we'll forget why it's important to start with. So, you know, that's one of the interests I have. Is there something particularly valuable also about the craft of art? I'm thinking about the, as you were talking there about the art, so arts and crafts movement, you know William Morris and so on, and how they thought that it wasn't just beauty in art, but it was also the make the making of things. That there was a there was a happiness in creativity, and that also. Uh, so then, so then you become the, pre, the you can allow people to appreciate doing things that are um, difficult. And require repetition, like like learning a violin or, the, or, or sketching a sketching something that look, is is hard to do. Uh, that also isn't simply a, the craft is itself a kind of access to something greater than itself. If that makes any sense, made sense when I said you, it. I think you put that really well. I I agree. I think that 
when we think about, you know, we were talking about enjoyable before and I've had someone say to me, but actually learning a musical instrument isn't very enjoyable. Yes, yeah, it's absolutely. really hard work. No. Um, my, I, my, my, daughter, my daughter did the violin and there were many years of the most terrible noise. <laughs> oh, well, I was a drummer, so think of my poor neighbours. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> so many rudiments. But, um, but there is something about... You, you know, as you say, you, you are a part of a, something bigger than yourself and something about the habituation, the cultivating of this practice. So as you said, um, to start with, I defend aesthetic theory um, and I use the word aesthetic deliberately. So the uh, book publisher suggested I just use the word arts because it's going to be more easily accessible and understood. And I stood by my guns and I was like, well, I want to say aesthetic because I'm including things like the theory and the the socio-cultural historical context and that art appreciation, not just making. But making is obviously an important part of it. And sometimes, you know, when these different art media are on offer to students, they'll find that they've got some talent or some way of expressing themselves through this medium that they didn't have before. And I think that is often one of the very obvious explanations why we should do arts on the curriculum so it's not the main defense I I offer but I have room for these supplementary explanations as to why art is important and one of the things we see most often on the curriculum is that it's for self-expression and of course as you said well how well am I expressing myself if I'm really bad at it (laughs) if I'm just starting out Um, but I think that learning to try and express yourself in other media than just words is an important part of that practice and appreciating that other people who do it well, you then start to have a sense of, well, how much work has gone into that. Yes, so there there is the art as, uh, the aesthetics as a practitioner, and then there's uh, the observer. So if you're going into the art gallery or, or seeing something, of an artistic or listening to something there's something you're a, you, there's a is there a literacy a kind of some ways some intervene between you and the experience and it helps you to understand it in more than simply well wow, that's a thing you know just to simply well that's big <laughs> that that's a surprisingly loud or whoa look at that i wonder what that means that someone will help you interpret that and that's maybe where the teacher comes in 100%. So this is where, you know, people like Elliot Eisner will talk about artistic literacy and he sees the intrinsic benefit of the arts in, in a cognitive um, way where we're understanding and interpreting um, and that might be in the reception of the artwork and or its creation. Um, so it could be in our critiquing of it, in its appreciating how it's displayed. There's different ways that we're engaging in that way. But, you know, if I listen to, you know, John Cage's Four Minutes of Silence and I haven't been taught anything about it, I'm not going to appreciate that. I'm not going to get any aesthetic experience from that artwork, presumably. So I need to understand a bit more about what's going on. And, I mean, even Deschamps Urinal, you walk in and it's displayed in the Tate and it's like, wow, look, there's a urinal. Like, you don't know what's going on. It might have a shock value. Um, but I think understanding a bit more around that context can help you to really appreciate and then gain more from it. So I think that the role for the art teacher is really important. And if we're talking about aesthetic education, it's very demanding because then we're talking about creating some art as well as receiving it and critiquing it, thinking about some of the context around it, um, particularly some you know more shocking or controversial artwork. And so that's quite a big demand on an art teacher. They they really do have to have specialist knowledge. That that strikes me. I, I recall first encountering Shakespeare at school. You said it's Shakespeare's difficult, and that that, that struck me as absolutely the case. It, a language I didn't understand in words that sounded very strange, until I until a teacher helped me to understand it. Then it was like a door opening, and I thought, ah. I want to go and see this in the theatre, that that began the process, which I was then able to pursue, Yeah, yeah. you know, in my own happiness and enjoyment of watching Shakespeare. 
Well, this is exactly right. You've learned the language. And in the article you referred to that I wrote, I give the example of um, opera music because as I've already alluded to, I studied music and our teacher was explaining to us um, about opera and we were studying Don Giovanni and, you know, this was in an area where, you know, it wasn't normal that most of the, the kids would be going to opera or hearing classical music in their homes and we, we, we learned a lot about it. And then when we finally sat down with the massive scores in front of us, and it's been sung in Italian and most of us speak English and we're following along. And by the end of it, we, the, we watched, we listened to the whole thing and we were, I think we went over the bell, you know, we finished <laughs> recess time and the whole class was dead silent. And when it finished, a few of us had a couple of tears rolling down our cheeks. We were just absolutely transfixed. And to have a whole class just sitting there, you know, in sort of, rapture silence like that is I think quite amazing when we're talking about I don't know 14 15 year olds oh absolutely and those are the moments when you're a teacher <laughs> you, you you wish to have and occasionally actually I, I yeah I recall those moments completely where something opened in the minds of the class in front of you not just all a few of them but all of them and you realize you, you you'd broken through and shown them a path they could pursue and that that you know, uh, lots of teachers are going, yeah, yeah, but on a Wednesday afternoon when it's raining outside. Well, but nonetheless, it, it happens. And it did. And do you know what? Even again, though, as, as unlikely it was in Perth, Western Australia, two of the students in my class went on to become opera singers, one who travels the world, and that is his career. He's an opera singer. Who would have thought it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, well, and that, that, was the, that was the moment. So art can be that. It can be the illumination of something beyond the everyday and it can be something that teachers can be the guide to I think that's right I think it it elevates the life from you know from mere survival from just making ends meet if we're going to use these human capacities that we have in this fully human way that enriched life is the flourishing life and of course my idea is that for when we have these young people in the classrooms you're inducting them into, you know, exposing them to all these wonderful things. Then when they've grown up as adults, they're autonomous. They can choose. They can select what they include and what they exclude. I'm not saying that they all, you know, all adults have to engage with art, even though you know, maybe I'd like to. Maybe that's an argument for a different book. <laughs> but they're more likely to choose it and understand its value if they've been inducted into it in this way to start with from, from an early age. Yes. Is there, um, how can we, I remember years ago, but my wife worked as a uh, ed, education sort of person at, at an art gallery. And they, the, the art gallery did some research into what who, who came through the door and who didn't come through the door. And they found that people from certain districts in the town came through the door and certain people didn't. Then when they followed this up with some market research, they, dis, they discovered the people that didn't come through the door, as it were, there was a socioeconomic link clearly and I asked when they why, why they didn't come through commonly they said because that they wouldn't know what to say if they went inside that they wouldn't know what to you know to do they and they would think they would get it wrong well you, you say well yes so, so art education can overcome that but art education sometimes is used to actually exacerbate that isn't it the art gallery then becomes and art itself can become a place where you say, well, you failed in it and you've succeeded in it. And the, what worries me in, in when you maze about schools can be that ability to say, well, what you've learned is you can't draw. And what you've learned is you don't understand high culture. And so uh, off you go into the world. And there are those that can and those that can't. Well, that, that, that makes me depressed about some of the, you know, the, the great moments in education are good, but then there's the exclusionary element of schools as well so how do we make art for all i think this is this is a tricky one because of course you're right and as soon as we're assessing and grading things then you know there's this feeling that we're ranking and i mean even if you didn't have assessment and you've got a group of students around if you're all drawing something we can see which of the students have this amazing talent which of the students just either you know naturally or have honed this this skill 
but of course we can all improve um, as we are educated and as we practice and I think that this is why we need to widen that canon and find the different media because often we'll be um, have some talent for a certain style or a certain media so you know the kid who's very good at drawing lifelike pictures you know another kid's very good at the music or the dancing or this particular style of artistic expression um, but coupled with that I think that everybody has the capacity to enjoy art and and different kinds of art and so I think that art galleries from what I've seen traveling around um, they do an amazing job of trying to bring people through the door and making it more accessible there's been a lot of work put into that and the educational programs where they're either bringing students into the art galleries or even bringing different programs out into the schools are really well thought out and you've got some really passionate people doing amazing things and it it does have to work in harmony with that community there's got to be something where which connects the place the art you know the artists the art galleries with the schools and and I mean in in different places you see things like um I mean my I'm going back to Australia because some of my experience is, is there but you've got these takeovers of um old laneways where they've been commissioned and reinvigorated by street artists and so again you've got something that is an art form that is often derided and was you know illegal and um, not high art at all but it's making these spaces that were very dangerous and and not fun and enjoyable and and recreating them into something that is accessible and interesting and brings lots of different kinds of people to look at them and then that's combined with little pop-ups you know food and bars and and so this kind of symbiosis when you're breathing life back in and as you said you said it yourself making art for everybody I think we can be creative about that, but it does need more stakeholders involved than just the one passionate art teacher. You, you, we need more support. And, yes, and, yes. And so it can't be, I mean, it might be one person changing the world, but ideally we need to all get on board with why the arts are valuable in these multiple ways. And that seems like a good place to take a break for the Teachers Talk Radio News. Please join us in a few minutes again with my guest, Dr. Laura Delimpio of Birmingham University as we discuss art in the curriculum and the case for an aesthetic approach. Teaching is a rewarding profession, but it comes with its fair share of challenges. That's where ADAPT come in. We're not your typical trade union, but instead a modern, apolitical alternative, offering expert legal, employment and mental health support. Protection without the politics. So what makes EDAPT different? We're always apolitical and independent, specialised solely in supporting individual teachers. Our caseworkers are professionally qualified, ensuring you always get the best advice. Plus, there's 24-7 mental health support. Whether it's a simple contract check or handling serious allegations, EDAPT are here for you. Join the thousands of educators who've chosen EDAPT to protect their careers. Subscribe at edapt.org.uk today. Adapt. Supporting school staff. Protecting careers. This is Teachers Talk Radio. And this is Teachers Talk Radio News. Schools may have to redraw budgets for the next academic year after what the BBC describes as a blunder by the Department for Education. A miscalculation came about because the number of pupils was underestimated. An original plan of a 2.7% increase per pupil in England for the academic year 2024-25 has now had to be revised to 1.9%. The government has ordered an inquiry and issued an apology. In a letter to the Education Select Committee, the DfE stressed that this was not a reduction to the total schools budget but said the amount promised had to be recalculated because an undiscovered error made by DfE officials during initial calculations. The BBC calculated that keeping the original planned increase of 2.7% 
would have meant the government having to find a further £370 million to top up the overall school's budget. Jeff Barton, General Secretary of the Association of School and College Leaders, said the error was unfortunate and frustrating and that it was likely that trusts and local authorities will have used the incorrect figures and will now need to revise budgets. A-levels and T-levels will be replaced by a new qualification for school leavers in England, according to new plans announced by PM Rishi Sunak. The plans reported across media outlets would see 16 to 19 year olds study around five subjects as part of the so-called Advanced British Standard, including some maths to 18. The plans prompted many to question how this would be delivered, but Mr Sunak said that more teachers would be recruited and that changes would be aimed at pupils who were currently only just starting primary schools. He also announced that the changes would see students spend 195 hours more with a teacher. He also promised an additional £600 million over two years to increase training of maths teachers and funding for those studying for compulsory GCSE resits in colleges in maths and English. The plans will go to consultation for possible implementation around 2033-34. to 34. But with a general election on the horizon, many may feel they are unlikely to happen should there be a change in government. The early years and primary sectors have responded to reports in the Times that children will have to brush their teeth under supervision in schools. According to the paper, Labour is planning to use schools and nurseries to help save NHS dentistry and that the party would introduce supervised toothbrushing in schools for children aged 3 to 5 and this would be prioritised in areas with the highest incidence of childhood tooth decay. Whilst dental associations and charities welcomed the proposals, Paul Whiteman of the NAHT said the union had serious reservations about how such a policy could even work and that it is not the role of teachers to make sure children brush their teeth. Schools Week reports on comments made by Amanda Spielman, Chief Inspector of Schools in England, at the Confederation of Schools Trust's annual conference. Ms Spielman was responding to questions about a rise in complaints to Ofsted about schools. In 2017-18, to 18, there were around 11,500 complaints, but in 2021-22, to 22, this had risen to almost 15,000. Ms Spielman said that post-Covid people were grumpier and have a greater propensity to put pen to paper. But the complaints leading to early inspection numbers weren't any higher than previously. She said there was no question more complaints were coming through, but that she was sceptical it reflected any real change. In Wales, the BBC reports on an ongoing school-run parking route. Residents of the street in Bridge End say issues at pick-up and drop-off times are persisting 18 months after a protest saw people living in a cul-de-sac blocking the road. They describe the scene outside of a nearby primary school as carnage and claim cars and property have been damaged. Residents have been blocked in their driveways and this has led to rising tempers. This is a perennial problem across the country for many who live near primary schools. The row in Wales is unlikely to be resolved anytime soon. Finally, student housing has made the news again this week this time in Salford, where, according to BBC Local News, a major student letting company has been accused of falsifying a tenant's signature on a document to defend a property's filthy conditions. The company is alleged to have added the signature to a waiver saying tenants were aware the property had outstanding maintenance when they moved in, but tenants said they had been told issues would be resolved beforehand. Upon arrival, they discovered a broken fire door, a boarded up window, and slugs and cockroach infestations. An investigation into the allegations of forgery has been launched. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. You're listening to the Friday Morning Break with John Gibbs and my guest this week, Dr. Laura Delimpio, Associate Professor in the School of Education at Birmingham University. And we're discussing art education and the importance of an aesthetic approach. Before the 
break, we were making the case for art, and if we if we were to make the case for art being valuable, it wouldn't simply be the economy, it would be more than that, it would be what you describe. A very old idea in a way, it goes right back to Aristotle, it's sort of, fat, the sort of flourishing life. What is the rounded human being? What is someone who can enjoy being themselves in this world? And art has a a role in that isn't it is it's beyond being productive or whatever it's something about getting up in the morning and wanting to get to the end of the day <laughs> yeah i think it's the question of what's a good life and there has to be space for everyone's good life to look slightly different according to their interests their attributes their talents you know their context um and so as you say it's an ancient idea it has become you know there's been a resurgence in interest in virtue ethics and that's flowed on to an interest in you know these virtual approaches to education for flourishing that's infiltrated into education um and it, and it takes different guises as well but at its heart this idea of what makes for a good life there's something essentially human about some of the features we all need and and I claim that this artistic or this, you mentioned the word creative before, this creative aspect, it's there. Now, obviously, we don't need to do much with it. Some people might say, oh, well, I'm just not very creative or artistic. It's just not something that interests me. But I think that there is different ways that it can be manifest and enjoyed and appreciated. And so even for the people who don't think that they're very artistic or creative, there might be some aspect that it's coming out in. And one of the examples I've given is the Mad Keen football fan who perhaps they're enjoying the, the chanting and the beating of the drums and the dressing up in their team colours. Maybe they'd really enjoy musical theatre. You know, who's to say? <laughs> I wonder how easy it is for us, that's in this society at this time, to appreciate the aesthetics of art when we live in the centre of a culture industry, the mass production of artefacts and artistic production through an in industrial scale level of production, Hollywood and films and the media. And to be able to understand that and appreciate that must be the great challenge of our times. This is, this is exactly what I did my PhD thesis topic on, um, actually, was looking at film, because I wanted to start with the thing that everyone engages with and I thought well everyone goes to the movies <laughs> and so there is the critique of well it's as you say mass produced and distributed and it's flattened reality it's canned emotional responses so yes you're getting an aesthetic response but it's very predictable now my response to that is twofold one is okay we'll just start with that <laughs> and engage with it critically and creatively um, and and connect it then to other examples and broaden that out. And, and that's one way of, you know, teaching people that if they enjoy film, then they might enjoy all these other things as well, like theatre or et cetera. But the second point I have is that the technology has the potential to also be democratising. And so while it may flatten, it also creates a space where people might be able to do really interesting and creative things and get it out to a wider audience that way. And so, you know, you can stumble across amazing artworks because we have social media. They're connected to everyone else in the world. We're sharing ideas and images um, more than ever before. And so I think that if we have a demand for what is, you know, quality and beautiful and and share that, that, that is something that we can use in that way. Now, obviously, of course, the technology has features inherent in it that works against us. You know, it encourages us for, you know, very quick and very sort of outrageous responses. And um, there's not, you know, the time that we probably need if we're going to really get into these aesthetic experiences. So we're, we're talking about the sort of value of TikTok. <laughs> well, this is the thing. So I might, you know, grab someone's attention on TikTok and be able to communicate my idea really quickly, but that's not going to do it justice, but it might be just the hook. So I think that's why we need art in the in the classroom um, where, the, you know, I mean, talking about time pressures, we go back to the classroom, but 
where there is a, a dedicated space for it. And if it's got that space carved out, it shows that it's valuable. It's it's important because the curriculum. Uh, absolutely. That. I, I have very mixed feelings about TikTok, really, because I know that when I go on TikTok, it's manipulating me. There's an algorithm. It's a very clever algorithm. It picks up anything I hesitate on for a second. It'll give me more of that. But I also know that I could, I haven't yet, yeah, haven't, but I could produce something that would be would be of my own creation and valuable to the world. I remember a friend and I, back in the 1970s, <laughs> we, managed to, we got a tape recorder my dad's cassette tape recorder, and we'd record little radio shows. And the sheer thrill of hearing them back to ourselves, you know, that's my voice. I put on a silly voice and we do the goon show or something silly like that. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, that technology enables me to produce something that lasts, that is a thing. It's a it's a creative technology. And so tech, TikTok is that, isn't it? I mean, it's also... The, the a great liberator for people that want to project themselves. Right, and how you were things. recording those shows back then was obviously practice for these wonderful programs you're doing now. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> it was a v- investment. <laughs> <laughs> you only had to wait forty odd years until I retired until it was actually, you know, still it was a slow burn, but good one. Yeah, I mean, I guess the biggest challenge to my argument is that we we wouldn't be able to have enough resources and time to try out all of the different art types and media um, in the in the classroom that I would like. And so, you know, sort of that necessity of, of choosing a few. Um, but and of course what we do see going back to that idea that um, that elitist worry of, of exclusion, um, it's the sort of well funded independent and private schools that have much more on offer they have more resources they have you know more well they, they have the appreciation and the value for the arts um but compared to some of the the state schools they there's just not the same offering there's this real uneven distribution of those resources and so you know it'd be great to just go back to well this is so valuable for that reason we need to consider that completely i mean that that is you know, when when a when a, a ticket to an opera in London at the Royal Opera House can cost a substantial amount of money, and um, and it's been subsidised by the government to be affordable by the by the relatively wealthy, you realise that there are them them well there's the possibility that that art becomes again we talked about this exclusionary and so on. So there's a number of fault lines in art. There's, there's the I remember my daughter who was very good at drawing, and is still is, actually. And she did art GCSE and loved art GCSE. Then she went to do art A-level. Now, in art A-level, an awful lot of the time seemed to be the teacher, quite rightly, in many ways, was saying, explore this different medium, explore that different medium, explore this. And, 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 and what she wanted was to be told how to draw, to, ex, to, to be given the craft skills of art. And you think, well, yeah, I can imagine going back to the old, you know, early 20th century, sitting in one of those art colleges, adult art colleges, where you're forever drawing a circle <laughs> and you're sketching a vase. And the, the teacher walks behind you and goes, oh, there's not quite right. You know, shade in the vase a bit more there. And I think, yes, I'd like to do that. I'd like to be able to have the craft skills in order to then go on to be the exploratory artist. So the te- one t- tension there is between, you know, art as simply an appreciation and exploration that we can all do. And art is something that is specialist that only the artists are capable of. Right. And so I think that I, I think I've started with the accessibility that um, because my, my focus has been on the aesthetic experience, I'm saying this is something that we all have. So, you know, not all of us are going to go on, on to be great artists, but if we have that taster where, you know, we have a chance to realise that that's something we can pursue further, like much of, further education uh, you know those those people can can go on and try that out and do that but I do want at least there to be firstly yes yeah, some t- tasting of of the different media and and making um, art but the aesthetic experience that engagement with that and what I have to think more through what I might you know look at in further research is this idea that if my emphasis is on the aesthetic experience 
might that shape or change how the art class could operate? Um, because the other thing is that it doesn't rule out aesthetic experiences, you know, with, with nature either. Um, and so there's there's these other elements that I need to think about a little bit more. Well, it is that romantic idea of the of the the beauty of nature. You know, wander wander through the woods, <laughs> go up to the mountain top, and well, you know, I, I don't doubt that is true. I I've experienced that. I think all we we all have the, the encountering a kind of natural beauty and thought. There's something beyond my ordinary self here. That, that we're all capable of that, I guess, but many of us might not be led to experience that. Now, is that what you're arguing for? Take, give people the chance to feel the beauty in the world. I'm using the word beauty. I'll use it. You know, aesthetic appreciation of the world that we can all have, that maybe educators sometimes don't give students the chance to experience i think that's one strand yeah that's one part of of my argument and there's there's a different like uh argument that could stem off from that one one that i have not argued but i was just thinking about your example that you're giving that you know it might be part of the defense for wanting to save the climate um and and protect the environment if we're exposed to that beauty of it you know, being propelled towards environmental policies. Um, but again, going back to the idea of that aesthetic experience in, in our lives, I think that when we're adults, we don't always create space and time for that because we are so focused and in a way we've been shaped to be so focused on these productive ends of well, what's useful, what's practical, what's going to get money and that's going to be helpful. And it's just everything's so quick. It's like, go, go, go. What's the next thing? So helping us to just slow down and pause and appreciate and enjoy and spend time on the arts in particular, um, if it's making or receiving and, you know, enjoying um, as a spectator, that, that, that has to be factored into our lives and I think we're only going to do that if we do appreciate that they're valuable because that's what we do we fill our lives either just with routine or with what we think is valuable and so my whole you know point is that exactly as you say that that experience is valuable everyone can get something out of it maybe they just need to find which of the artworks are going to do that for them but to teach them that they're entitled to that that that's allowed to be a part of their lives and it does elevate the life. So that's the kind of argument I'm making. And and I do want it to be art for everybody. So that's why I sort of talk about broadening the canon and it not just being ballet and opera, um, even though I still think that, you know, they, they are obviously amazing. Um, and often you do need to be inducted into those art forms to be able to get something out of them. They're not immediately yeah. accessible. And, and if I like or rather the encountering of art is going to be everything in a sense where you can gain some sort of aesthetic experience then the, is, is there a possibility that we say well if, if everything is art then nothing is art that, that, that it's, it, you're, it's simply living in a certain way you're, you're you're describing a kind of um living in the moment you, know, you, you can find beauty in the in the leaf in the moth on the window pane, you can find beauty in anything. Or if not beauty, then everything in everything. You can find ugliness in everything. Uh, that that simply simply being alive, and it's a kind of being alive you describe. So this is really interesting. I think I didn't make this explicit in the book that I've just finished writing, but I think you might have just um, uncovered a hidden <laughs> sentiment that I, I'm working with here because I was very influenced when I was... Uh, studying my honours degree, I was influenced by this Nietzschean idea of living life as an artist and, you know, living life with this aesthetic attitude. And it's one of his earliest works from The Birth of Tragedy. Um, he becomes much more cynical after that. But it was used um, by Mother Nussbaum when she was talking about this sort of creative way of living in the world. And I think the, the romantic heart of you know this this idea that I have is is probably that but you know I certainly haven't tried to 
make that argument itself but I think that secretly uh, I do really like that idea that yes you look for the beauty in the world it's quite idealistic isn't it <laughs> it is yes and it's a challenge it's something that asks you to wake up and uh, <laughs> and not be so caught up in the everyday or even if you are sitting on the tube and Look, look outside the window and see what's going on and look and, and be alive. And, you know, as you say, that Nietzschean idea of, of being... The thing about that, though, is that few of us have time to be supermen, you know, to, to look beyond ourselves. And the artist will claim that. And that's the trouble with, in a sense, Nietzsche, is that, you know, it's kind of... Yeah, Nietzsche, you, you, you think of yourself not only as, it, as demanding that we be more than ourselves, you think you are I think and so right. the artist the artist pushes the boundaries and leaves the rest of us behind well that's true in a way they're going to the exemplar and they're sort of you know offering the manifest version of that but in Nietzsche's Nietzsche's idea of living life as an artist he says that every single person in, in a way it goes back to that virtue ethics idea of cultivating and habituating certain kinds of habits really and of course, he, he connects it not just to the habits of how we say what we say uh, and how we present what we present. So it could even be connected to, you know, the way, not just the way we choose to live our life, um, but the way we present ourselves and, and, and how we have our environment around us. And it's like just that idea of something that's pleasing to our eye. There is actually a strong subjective streak here, right? So it's not just, oh, well, it all has to look the same way, but what's pleasing to me? And and the idea that I can practice it and, and improve upon it. So I said that that way and, and it was too blunt or too rude and crude. Maybe I can try again next time and it's okay. I can work at refining it. And so I that's what I liked about it was the idea that I'm a constant artwork in progress. So it's not that I'm going to ever be this sort of finished product. <laughs> well, obviously, my whole life I'm going to be working towards what what artwork have I created my entire world, my life. Um, but it is sort of this overarching theme and maybe it is way too transcendental, but uh, I was quite struck by this idea. <laughs> no, absolutely. I, I, I wish we could convince, uh, uh, well, you know, I, I think, I don't know. Yeah, absolutely right. I, I hope it's true. I don't know if it's true, but I hope it's true as a teacher. What, what The flourishing life means something like that as yourself, as an open-ended project and not something that's going to close, that you are all the time um, open, open to the new and open to a world of exploration and uh, developing yourself. I mean, that sounds very, I know, you know, you know walk into some bookshop and say, how to live the good life or something. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't, want to write, I don't want to write a book on, uh, on, on, on self-improvement. But nonetheless, I believe it. Well, I think educators... I'll, I'll, I'll be a romantic. Well, this is the thing. Educators are giving these students the tools the toolkit for their lives that they choose how to use those tools right and i just think yeah. we need to not forget the paintbrushes and you know the artistic tools that's the take-home message yeah what about the art that is disturbing the art that that is you know francis bacon three figures at the foot of the crucifix I think that's all right, and, and and so on. Something that leaves you a little uncertain about the beauty in the world, and more certain of the pain and painfulness of human existence. Is that also something you should expose? You should lead students towards in school. Yeah. So I I think that the aesthetic experience encompasses all of these different emotions of being human. I think that's what art is about. It's about exploring our humanness. And that's why I think the role of the art teacher is so important. So my main line for the most part is that when we're considering those contexts and the themes, we have to be engaged critically and charitably. So we try and understand the work that we don't just accept that, you know, for instance, if there's an unethical message in there, it's not just about censorship. It's about, okay, well, let's try and engage with that work and understand why it was created and and how we interpret it so some of the classic examples given are of Wagner's ring cycle or the films of Leni Riefenstahl which celebrate you know Nazi Germany and Hitler 
Um, and so it's this idea that when there is aesthetic beauty in artworks that might have um, morally reprehensible messages, these are really interesting works, but we need to activate that critical capacity and engage with them critically and try and understand what's going on. So my interest is actually in aesthetics and ethics. And it's like, well, how do we use these to provoke questions? And I honestly think going back to that idea of perceptivity, then we go and look at what else is in the world now and say, okay, what do we see that reminds us of this? How do we challenge that? How do we critique that? How do we interpret and, you know, make meaning out of those things? So I think that it's artists do push the boundaries, as you say, and they're often inviting us to reflect on important themes in the world. And so we should be doing that. Like, I don't think that it has to be, it can be completely removed from, you know, everyday existence, but otherwise, yeah, yeah, let's use it to reflect back on meanings of gender and social class and politics. Absolutely. I, you know, I, that's such a good, as we can come to the last part of this discussion, I think that's such an important point, the one that's come up so many times in recent discussions I've had, is that the necessity of to be engaging critically with the world around you, so that it isn't so much important that you say, this is art. This is the best that can be thought and said. Observe young young ones and and learn. It's also that ability to critique the world. And goodness me, with the hyper-production of stuff, and the hyper-production of images that we have in the world, how important that is to be critical, evaluative, and know the language of engagement. You know, to be able to talk about things in terms of gender and see what's going on there. And talk it and talk about it in class and see what's going on there and history and see what's going on there. It's so important. Absolutely. We I think more more so than ever. Well, exactly, more so than ever. We've got this, you know, resurgence of cancel culture and polarization where the idea that if you disagree with someone on something, you just can never speak to them again. And that's a real worry. I am very interested in promoting dialogue. So how do we have respectful disagreement? And I think art is a really great and fairly safe medium for that because it can be very provocative. And if it's a fictionalized space, we can engage with very deep and challenging thoughts, themes, emotions in a, a, a space that is fictionalized and therefore one step removed from the real world. And we can explore it in relation to artworks. We don't have to agree that we all like this artwork or that artwork. We can have a discussion about it. And then perhaps we can practice those skills that are then so needed in our everyday world, especially when we're talking about politics. Yeah, it's almost like what you're saying is that we need a reminder of something about what the Greeks did when they watched tragedies. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and a kind of reminder that isn't always nice. And the, the important thing is to be able to do that and to experience it in a way which is thoughtful and articulate and just you know walk away from the theater what are you talking about <laughs> and be able to discuss that so that, that seems to be a powerfully important message and one that is a case for aesthetic education absolutely uh, i'm glad i'm uh, oh, you're on board <laughs> like i'm convinced <laughs> <laughs> i probably uh, yeah i probably was convinced already and i know the you know i know that um uh, that may make me, uh, you know, an old elitist or something. But I don't think so. I don't think you've made a case that it, it isn't just that at all. It's very, very democra democratic, and very, um, very about what teachers should do. So thank you, Laura, so much for this discussion today. I really enjoyed it, and so we've uh, concluded this episode of the Teachers Talk Radio. Thank you for joining. Thanks so much, John. And that brings to an end another episode of the Friday Morning Break with John Gibbs, in which I've continued to explore what schools are for. This week, my guest was Dr. Laura Delimpio, Associate Professor of Education and Director of Postgraduate Research at Birmingham University School of Education. Laura's field is the philosophy of education, and we discussed art and the aesthetic approach to art and the importance of aesthetics in education generally. 
Laura has published extensively on the subject and many other subjects, and you can find her works, her books, and her pamphlets on the University of Birmingham website. If you wish to listen to this podcast again, you can find it on Spotify and many other platforms. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.